for the sake of connection and community, let's start creating some of that here today. So if you are new, who is new? Who has never been to one of my workshops before live? Maybe you, you have one of my courses that is a, a, um, a self-study course, um, but who has never been to any of my workshops and been anything live? You've seen my YouTube videos. Those are recorded. Who is brand new, says Wes. Newbie, says Olga. New to workshops, says Josh. Sharon is new. Gregory is new. Denise, new. Diana, Stephen, Kat, Tom, Terry, wow, lots of new people. So welcome. I am so glad to have you here live in this talk today. Special shout out to you for showing up and being here and for all of you taking a moment to recognize yourself for showing up and doing this work, being willing to do this work, being willing to take this step because it's a big deal. You've set aside the time, you set aside the mental space and energy to do that. And so I want you to just take a moment and say, good for me for showing up for myself today. So if you are new and you don't know who I am, my name is Julia Christina. I am a registered therapist. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. I am also a therapeutic coach, a speaker, an author of my book, Drive Your Own Darn Bus. And I have a little YouTube channel where we talk about this stuff and go a little bit deeper. And then I have a membership community called The Shift Society, where we take this work to the next level with community, accountability, support, ongoing teachings, ongoing support, ongoing help, ongoing therapeutic coaching in there. And I teach you in that as well, a five-step process to be able to manage your mind and emotions so that you can be thinking better, feeling better, having better, and living better every single day. What we know is that loneliness is going around and it's having a pretty big impact. How many of you feel lonely either some of the time and you'd rather feel lonely less often or a lot of the time and you'd rather feel lonely less often? Let me know in the chat there. Yep. Michelle says me. Yep. Jasmine almost daily. A lot. Gosha says a lot. Maria. Um, Gonzalo and Tony and Steven. Uh, Irini is sometimes, some of the time, a lot. Yeah. 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 So what we need to know for sure is that even before psychological distress and loneliness increased during the COVID-19 pandemic, a January 2020 survey reported that one, uh, sorry, that over three in five Americans felt lonely on a pretty regular basis. Now, we also know that these stats aren't just exclusive to Americans, people living in the United States, but globally, this has been something that has been significantly increasing even before the pandemic. I started my membership community, The Shift Society, in February of 2020, right before a lot of places in the world went into lockdown and people were far more separated than they ever, ever had been before. When I opened up my membership, we filled up and were flooded with registrants almost immediately. And then we actually had to close down registration early because we had so many people joining. And this was before the pandemic. And what this said to us is that people wanted to be connected. People wanted somewhere to go where they could share, where they could get support, where they could learn, where they could have conversations around things that they were dealing with and they could get suggestions and they could stop feeling alone and they could have other people in a community that cared about the same things as them and were committed to better just like they were because they found that they didn't have any like-minded people in their everyday lives who could be on this journey with them, support them, help them, encourage them, and understand them. Then we opened up registration again just a few months later after, after the pandemic because we were like, oh gosh, uh, this is going to be an issue. People are going to even more than ever going to need somewhere to belong. And then we brought in another flood of people at that point. 
But what we know is that loneliness is on the rise and it is not going down. Even though we have access to social media, we have access to the internet, we have access to being able to see into other people's lives more readily, more easily, but it is not giving us a deeper sense of connection. What we also know is that according to a study published in the journal, uh, in the journal PLOS Medicine, the health consequences of loneliness are comparable to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. So not only does loneliness impact our mental health and well being, it also significantly impacts our physical health and well being. Let's look at some of these other health impacts of loneliness. Loneliness is also associated with poor sleep. When people feel disconnected, when people feel alone, they don't sleep as well because their brain is unable to find that level of peace that we need in order to get a restful night's sleep. We also know that loneliness can impact the immune system and lower your metabolism. So it really slows everything down. Many of the same symptoms of loneliness are symptoms of depression, which those of you who are feeling quite lonely or have ever gone through boats of loneliness, how does it feel? How do you know that you are feeling lonely? What does it feel like in your body? Just take a minute and recall the last time you felt lonely. If you're feeling lonely night, right now, or if you did shortly before our workshop started today, what does it feel like in your body? How do you know? What would be going on inside of you? You'd be like, yeah, it's loneliness that I'm feeling right now. What is it? How does it feel? Uh, yes. Michelle says empty. Yeah. Maria says last night and I felt depressed and lonely. Okay. What did it feel like, Maria? What did it feel like in your body? Empty and tired, fear, sadness, like the air is too thin, flushed face, hot ears, stomach drops, sad, ache in the chest, uh, anxiety. What did anxiety feel like on physically? Uh, lost my mojo, empty sadness, empty, useless, tired, sadness. Marat says chest pain. Like I don't belong here, says Krishna. Like I'm a zombie, brain fog. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of going through the motions, not really connected, right? That emptiness, can't focus, headache, um, empty and anxiety, ache in the chest, lots of aching in the chest. Lots of that going on. Loneliness is also associated with low, lower social connectedness. Uh, sorry, lower social connectedness is associated with higher chronic pain. When we feel alone and disconnected, our bodies are communicating to us that this is wrong, that this is not okay, that this does not feel right. And then obviously, loneliness puts people at a greater risk for poor mental health, including depression, depression and make you think that life is bleak and pointless. People need close relationships in order to thrive. But more than that, people need close relationships in order to survive. It was pioneer, forefather, grandfather of modern psychology, Alfred Adler, who was a contemporary of Freud, but where Freud was saying that all of our um, psychological neuroses were caused by our repressed sexual desires of the parents of the opposite sex, our parents of the opposite sex, a sex, and this is where all of our issues are coming from. Adler said, well, I don't know about that. I have a feeling that we are a little bit more complex in all of our issues coming, uh, being stemming from sexual, repressed sexual desire. And he said that genuine human connection is as, as essential to our survival as air and water. 
We need human beings. We need connections. We are literally hardwired for it. And when we don't have it, things go wrong. Physically, mentally, emotionally. So now let's look at the three categories of loneliness. And this might really help those of you who are like, I don't feel lonely all the time, but there are definitely times that I do. So let's understand this a little bit better. There's the first uh, category of loneliness is transient lo loneliness. So this is just a feeling that comes and goes. It's not something that you feel all the time, but it can kind of show up sometimes. And you're not always sure exactly why that loneliness is, is showing up. And just let me know in the chat if this is, has ever been something that you experienced. You could be at a social gathering, um, at a at a you know at a at a place of of worship. You could be out with some friends. You could be, um, you know, doing something at work. And one day you're doing this thing and you feel great. You feel happy. You feel connected. You feel vital. And then the next time you're in a very similar, if not the same situation, you feel empty. You feel lonely you feel kind of numb and like not connected to that thing. Something is going on and it feels different. You feel that loneliness. Has that ever happened to you where one time you're in a situation, it feels great. Another time it does not feel great. And you feel, yeah, Merrick says that happens with me. Irene says happens. Liz has that's happened to you. Yeah. Jasmine says that that has happened. Yao. Yes. Maria. Yes. Sharon. Yeah. That's happened. Agnes. Okay. So that would be transient loneliness, where it's an experience that can come and go. And often why we can have this happening without warning, where we can think that something one time was great and the next time not so great, is because often there's deeper things going on that are unresolved, that are coming up for us more on an unconscious level that haven't been dealt with. And we don't really have the ability to tune in and be like, what's going on? Why is this coming up for me? Because we haven't learned that level of emotional intelligence yet because they don't teach it in school. So if you haven't done the work to learn emotional intelligence, then you wouldn't know. And so, so often we can be experiencing things without understanding what's going on. And it can be very confusing because we don't really understand what's going on then we don't really know what to do about it. Another type of loneliness is situational loneliness. So this is something that comes up at certain times of year or in certain particular circumstances, often in things, you know, times like uh, holidays that are typically spent with loved ones, uh, things like Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever holiday in your culture is typically one that is spent with family or close friends where there's just sort of this expectation that this is what people are doing. You see it around you. Everyone else is kind of doing this. And and you're not, it can make you feel really lonely. Or, you know, something like on, on Sundays, often that has been traditionally a family day or a day of gathering. A lot of times people talk about having Sunday dinner with their family, Sunday night pot roast, Sunday potlucks, whatever that is, uh, that day when you're not doing that. And it can be for several reasons. Maybe it's not necessarily because you don't have any family or friends to celebrate with. Maybe it's because you don't have a great relationship that with family. And so you're not able to do that and spend that time together. Maybe it's because you've lived, you're living in a new culture, you're living somewhere else where you haven't yet made those connections. You don't have close enough friends to be able to share special occasions and holidays with. Maybe it's because you're going through something right now and you just need to be alone as you deal with it. But in the process of taking that time alone to deal with it, you are missing out on some other things that are happening and therefore feeling even more lonely as you sort it out. So whatever your reason, you are feeling lonely in this particular situation. Yeah, Yao says, I don't have a good relationship with my family sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And then the other type of loneliness is chronic loneliness. This is when we are experiencing loneliness all or at least most of the time. Loneliness 
is not just about feeling disconnected in general, though. There are actually three types of relationship deficits that lead to loneliness. So let's get even more deeper into understanding loneliness so that we can know what to do about it. The first type of loneliness is intimate loneliness. So this would be the absence of a partner with a, you know, not just a partner, but a partner that you have a good relationship with or a best friend. So just not having that intimate connection, not having someone that you can share your deepest, darkest with, someone that you can talk about the most mundane day-to-day -day irrelevant things with, someone that you can talk about and share that, either of those or everything in between, someone that you feel like just knows you, accepts you, gets you, and you feel safe and comfortable being yourself with them. It doesn't have to come through an intimate partner. We all know now through research that it can be with a best friend. It can just be anyone in your life that you feel like you can just exhale and be yourself and you don't have to put on a show or try so hard or be something that you're not or put in a big effort. You can just exist and that existence matters. That existence is important. That existence is witnessed. And you feel that on a deeper level. So that's the first type of loneliness. Ha not having that will create that type of loneliness. The next type is social loneliness. So this is just when you have a perception that you have a de uh, deficit in the quality of social connections. So just in general, not feeling like you just have people around that you recognize, that you know, if you are if you have kids in school, like other parents that uh, you see during drop-off and have a connection with, you're not part of some kind of social group where you know a bunch of people and, you know, when you show up, you know their names, you know their faces, you feel kind of disconnected from your neighborhood, you don't know your neighbors, you don't really feel like you have people that you could maybe call up for a games night or to go skiing for the day or whatever that is. This is this loneliness where you just don't feel like you have connections. And usually these types of relationships are activity-based or situation-based relationships. They're context-based relationships. They're not necessarily those deep, deep, uh, intimately personal relationships, but there's people around that you know that they are available, that you can chat with, you can go to lunch with, even at work, you know, having people at work that you can chat with, that you can spend some time with, that you can um, complain about the boss with. <laughs> so this is a social loneliness. If you don't feel like you really have that, you don't have those little connections that you are experiencing throughout your day. And this was a big one actually during the pandemic that people really noticed was those lack of social connections, just those every day going to the grocery store and saying hello and having a chit chat with the person working at the checkout or, you know, uh, walking into a public place and holding the door open for someone and having that eye contact and them saying thank you to that. Going into the coffee shop and getting a coffee and just having a little interchange with the barista working there, walking down the street, seeing other human beings and making eye contact and smiling, just saying hello, good day, how are you doing? Just these casual conversations that we didn't get to have, these casual interactions, this sense of familiarity and connectedness to our community that was lacking so much. And people really felt that that would be social loneliness. The next type of loneliness is collective loneliness. And this is a feeling of a lack of involvement who share a common interest, a common goal, or a common purpose. So this would be being involved if you didn't have some kind of um, activity community, church community, um, uh, social community, someone who are a group of people who have a very like interest, so a, 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 a 
community of hobbyists who have a very similar interest, people who are interested in the same topic, people who have a common goal or working towards something together, have a common understanding where you just know that when you walk into a room with these people, you have something important to you that is in common. It's something that's important to everybody else. So you can have meaningful conversations about this particular thing. You can hold each other accountable. You can question and go deeper. You can experience and explore because you have a common interest. It's like these like-minded, like-hearted people. And this is something that we need. I can tell you that for a long time, I felt incredibly lonely, but I didn't understand why. And I spent a long time beating myself up about it. And I didn't really get it because I would look around and I'm like, I have intimate relationships. I have people in my life that I can go to. I have people in my life that I know I could call in the middle of the night in a crisis who would be there for me in a second. I have people that I can call crying to if I'm having a bad day. I have people that will listen to me if I need someone to talk to. So I have that intimate connection. And then I was also like, well, you know, I also have the social connection. I know people, I feel connected to my community. I know my neighbors, I know, I recognize the barista at the coffee shop that I go to. Uh, there's parents of my kids' friends that I see and that I have little conversations with when I drop my kids off at school. So why do I feel so lonely? And I'm not gonna lie to you, I've felt very lonely, not all the time, but at significant periods of time, many times throughout my life. And I know because I've experienced it too, just like so many of you, it is a horrible feeling to feel like you are around people, to feel even like maybe like you have people and then to feel so isolated to feel that empty feeling, that tightness in the chest, that kind of numb, disconnected, kind of feeling like you're floating through life and there's not enough to tether you to the ground. And then after doing this research, I realized that it was because I lacked that collective connection. I was had the collective loneliness. I felt really alone. I didn't have anything that I was doing, anything that I was important to me, anything that I was working towards, anything that I was invested in. I wasn't doing that with anyone. I didn't have people that I could talk to, people that were got it, people that were on the same page as me, that cared about the same things as me when it comes to those things that were really important to me and didn't realize that it's because I have invested in so much in so much of this part in the last few years that all of a sudden I don't feel lonely anymore. I can't remember the last time I felt lonely and it's not because I had one of these. It's not because I had two of these. It's because I now had all three of these types of connection. So I no longer felt intimately lonely and no longer felt socially lonely and I no longer felt collectively lonely. It's evident that people need meaningful connections and it's no coincidence that the strength of our social ties largely determines our level of happiness throughout our lifetime. Let's talk a little bit about physical health and what it means to be physically healthy. What do you think? What do you think it means to be physically healthy? Just kind of randomly spitball. What are the main things that you're like, if someone was like, okay, I'm going to start taking care of my health. What would you say that they are going to do off the top of your head? Stay fit, stay hydrated, have a good physique, vitality, get exercise, have good sleep, right? Eat well. Um, yes. Pay attention to nutrition, eating healthy, look after the body, move and eat healthy. Yeah, and that's exactly it, is that most would say that to be healthy, you need nutritious food, exercise, and adequate sleep. But would you think that in order to be healthy, we also need social connection? 
as we talked about, loneliness is associated with poor physical health. So in order to be healthy, we also need connection. We need to feel a part of something. We need to feel like we, our lives are a matter and are being witnessed by other human beings. We need to feel like the things that we care about are things that other people care about and we can have conversation around it, connection around it. Connecting with others is more important than we might think. More important than many of us give priority, priority to, not only about our physical wellness, but social connection can lower anxiety and depression, can help us regulate our, regulate our emotions, lead to higher self-esteem and empathy, and actually, as we talked about, improve our immune systems. By neglecting, or sorry, just know that if you're feeling lonely, you, you're not the only one. You don't have to live in emotional or physical isolation. We live in a world with over 7 billion people and we all need connection. This isn't a you thing. This is an us thing. So what does feeling socially connected do for you? If we know what loneliness and isolation does for us, does against us, then what does feeling socially connected do for you? What we know about humans is that we are collective beings. Since the beginning of time, human beings have traveled, hunted, and thrived in social groups. And for good reason. It is because it is not just what we need to do to thrive. It is what we have needed to do throughout history, only until the last few hundred years or less. It's what we've needed to do to survive. Throughout history, humans that have been separated from their tribe often suffered severe consequences. Specifically, they usually died. We could not exist without other human beings. So not only do social groups provide us with, a, with an important part of our identity, more than that, they teach us a set of skills that help us prosper in a complex environment. Feeling socially connected, especially in an increasingly isolating world, is more important than ever. The mistake that we have made in so many of our of our of our of our communities and societies is that because now we have collectively as a world in most parts of well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, in many parts of the world where people have become more wealthy, we have become more separate. Because we can live in our own homes, we can have our own yards, we can go about and commute to our jobs on our own, we can sit in our offices by ourselves, we can get our work done on our own, we can provide for ourselves. And so we think that because we don't need human beings to the same extent in order to survive physically, we forget that we absolutely need them in order to survive mentally and emotionally. We need human relationship in order to thrive. So although there have been wonderful things that have come from the, the wealth that we have accumulated and the opportunities and freedoms that that has given us, we have neglected to recognize that often with that comes separation. If I can live my life physically without you, I forget that I cannot thrive mentally and emotionally without you. So what else does being connected do for you? It improves your quality of life. If you have ever moved away from your home base, then you probably understand the degree to which social connection shapes your everyday life and well-being. Studies show that feeling socially connected creates higher self-esteem, greater empathy, 
uh, it makes people more trusting and cooperative. And as a consequence, others are more open to trusting and working with those who are more open to working with them. In other words, social connectedness generates a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. When we show up with an open stance, open to connection, open to relationships, open to other human beings, most of the time they respond in kind to that which shows us that they are interested in being connected. Those endorphins start firing in our brains when we feel connected. And then as we feel connected to others, we start, we, or sorry, we continue to show up in those relationships, which they become responsive to, which shows us that it's something positive in our lives. And then it just keeps going like this. For those of you who have been through something difficult, painful, or traumatic, where trust has been broken, where you have been deeply hurt, where maybe you have written off human beings because you're like, everyone sucks and they're just out to hurt me. This can be harder to break through that. It can feel scary. It can feel vulnerable. So what I want to do is invite you to take baby steps. And we're going to talk about what some of those baby non-threatening steps will can be in just a few minutes here. What we also know is that uh, social connection boosts your mental health. Friendships offer a number of mental health be benefits, such as increased feelings of belonging, purpose and confidence, amplified levels of happiness, reduced levels of stress, and improved self-worth. A study conducted at a free health clinic in Buffalo, New York, found that respondents with insufficient perceived social support were the most likely to struggle and suffer with mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. Simply put, feeling connected is a buffer against feeling like crap. Feeling connected helps you live longer. Research has shown that a sense of belonging improves your mental, not just your mental health, but your physical well-being as well. A review of 148 studies with 308,000 participants indicated that individuals with stronger social relationships had a 50% increased likelihood of survival. That remained true across a number of factors, including age, sex, initial health status, and cause of death. Obviously, strengthens your immune system. We have mentioned this. Research by immunologist Steve Cole shows that genes impacted by loneliness also code for immune malfunction and inflammation and shows that connection helps you recover from disease faster. Obviously, increased fulfillment. When we connect with friends, whether it's through a quick phone call or a nature hike, we can go through a multitude of emotions. We're either laughing or crying or venting. When we express those emotions, our brains release dopamine and endorphins, the feel-good neurotransmitter responsible for happiness and mood. Simply put, we need human connection. We are hardwired for it. When we have good relationships. We thrive. The cells in our bodies light up. Our immune system is boosted. Our stress response becomes more robust. Our physical health improves. Our lives get better. This isn't to say that relationships are always easy. It doesn't mean that they're not complicated. It doesn't mean that they're not sometimes hard and require work. But what we know for sure is that they are worth it. Now let's look at 12 simple ways to start feeling more connected and create a true sense of belonging. For those of you who are like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. How can I start to feel more connected? Maybe you're like, I kind of don't feel super comfortable putting myself out there and being the spotlight or the center of the conversation or the center of attention. I don't want to do that. And I'm going to tell you introverts, you are in the right place. If you are an extrovert and you're like, I also don't necessarily want to put myself out there and be in the center of attention, but I do want more social connection. 
you are in the right place. If you're like, you know what? I feel like I have people in my life. I feel like I've got things going on, but I want to feel more connected. I don't want to feel lonely so often. Then you are in the right place. These 12 simple ways are going to cover all of that. And I want you to really take note of which ones connect with you. And you're like, that feels doable. I could do that. And I also don't want you to underestimate the powers of the ones that seem really maybe even overly simple. These are all backed by research and they all make a difference. So check off the ones that you're like, I could do that and start doing it and notice the difference in how you feel. First one. Volunteer at a nonprofit organization near you. In all of my research on happiness, I have been researching happiness for years because I my goal is always to try to learn everything I can, be on the cutting edge of research about what it takes for human beings to thrive. And what keeps coming up as one of the top ways to increase our happiness is to do something for someone else. Which if I don't know what bigger proof there is that we are hardwired for connection, if that's not it, I don't know what it could be. That giving back, being involved, making a difference is good for us. When you enroll in a class or are scheduled to meet up with a friend or group, avoid canceling or no-showing. Consistency matters. Being there matters. Because what happens is if we cancel frequently, back out at the last minute, both what it can do is communicate to the other person that we may not be all that interested or that group of people that we're not all that interested, depending on whether it's an individual or a group, can show that we're not that interested, we're not that invested, we don't care that much. And so eventually they stop asking or it can show them that we are unreliable and it can be really disappointing for the other person if they have scheduled their time to do this thing with you, to be there with you. And then you cancel, then now their block of time that they were planning to spend with you, that they had a plan, that they could have planned to do something else, but they set aside that time for you that now they don't have anything. So that can be disappointing. And I'm not saying that we're not allowed to cancel, that it's horrible if you ever cancel, you never can cancel, come hell or high water, you always have to show up. Of course not. We all have things that come up at the last minute, emergencies or you know illness, or we are just having a horrible day. And the last thing that we want to do is go and be around three-dimensional people and just need to give ourselves the freedom to opt out. But if we are making this a pattern, it does have consequences. And you probably know that in your own life. Think about if you have a friend who backs out a lot, who cancels a lot, and how likely are you to continue to ask them to show up? How likely are you to rely on them? How likely are you to feel like you can count on them? How likely are you to keep putting in that effort for that relationship if that keeps happening? And the truth is probably a lot less likely than the friends who do show up, who are there, who put in the effort, who are consistent, who are reliable. Consistency matters. Get more physical, regardless of the type of relationship, a hug can go a long way. If you feel safe, if you feel comfortable, having more human connection. Not only that, but hugs don't just feel good emotionally. Hugs relief release endorphins, which boosts our immune system. So literally, if you are sick, get more hugs. If you're contagious, maybe put on a mask before you get that hug so you're not spreading your germs to everyone else or find someone else who has the same virus or whatever it is. And uh, you guys give each other lots of hugs because you know they're not gonna be spreading to anybody else. But get hugs, give hugs. If you are feeling even down or low or, or, or worn out, get a hug. It has these natural mood and emotion building factors. When engaging in conversation, actively listen, try to be present. And it's amazing how in this day and age, 
having someone's undivided attention for an entire conversation is becoming something that we really notice and appreciate. And why is that? Because so often people are distracted. They have their phones, they have their bings, their bongs, their booms, they're picking up, they're looking at, they're, you know, not fully with us. At restaurants, you'll see people in restaurants, both people on their phones, not even really talking to each other. So it is so much easier to build healthy relationships because it requires so much less than it did before. In many ways, all you have to do is pay attention to the conversation and give someone your undivided attention and seeing how much that matters. Listening to what they are saying and letting them listen to you when you have something to say, being able to open up and share, being responsive to their open up and sharing and actually having a real time, real conversation with another human beings. Reach out to a friend that you've lost touch with. How many of you have had the thought in the last day, week, or even few weeks about a friend that you used to be pretty close with, but for whatever reason, you've lost touch? Someone that at some point in your life was meaningful to you, someone that you had a really great connection with, or just someone that is still in your life, but you haven't made the effort to reach out to them in a while. And you're like, ah, I need to reach out to them. I need to call them. How many of you have been meaning to call that person? Yeah, lots of you. Yes, yes. Yesterday, today. Wow. Yes, yes. Always. Okay. Yeah. So I want to encourage you and invite you to reach out to that person today. After our workshop, take a minute, make the call, send the text, write the email, and make that connection. Eat lunch in a communal space. This doesn't mean again that you have to sit and chat. Maybe you don't really want to sit and chat. You want a few minutes of quiet while you're, you know, throughout your day. You want just a few minutes to yourself, but you can do that among other human beings. We are wired for connection. We thrive when we are around other humans. It doesn't mean we always even have to be talking, interacting, or engaging with those people, but just being around other human beings allows us to feel more connected. Introduce yourself to your neighbors. This is something that's so wild to me because I remember when I was growing up, we knew all of our neighbors so well. It was just sort of this understanding that you knew your neighbors, that you invested in your neighbors, that you talked to your neighbors, that you went over and introduced yourself to your neighbors when you moved in somewhere. And I know that this is something beautiful that still happens in many communities, but it's becoming less and less frequent. People are so much more behind their four walls and not staying connected to the people in their in their just immediate communities. So introduce yourself to your neighbors. It's amazing what just being able to say hello, give a smile, have a wave, just a casual little how is your day going as you are just moving through your existence. Just those little anchor points throughout your day, how much those things matter. Do a random act of kindness, hold a door, buy a coffee for the person behind you in line, say something nice about something that you admire, you know, that you see another person. If you're like, I really like that person's sweater. And I really like that woman's sweater. Being able to just say that I really love that sweater. It's that color is fantastic on you. These little things, these little micro points of connection, they matter. Look people in the eye and smile. I know for some of us who may feel a little less trusting, who may feel a little bit more self-conscious or struggle with our confidence, feel a little bit lower on the self-esteem scale, this might be a harder thing to do. But if you can, try to just look up when you're passing someone on the street, on the sidewalk, when you're walking past someone in the grocery store, just a little smile. Make some eye contact, acknowledge someone else's existence. You know, I get it. Sometimes we go out, we're just like, I don't wanna like engage with any other human beings. I just wanna get done what I need to get done and get back home. And absolutely, there's no problem with that. But just make sure that that's not all the time. Make sure that you are taking those times and seizing those moments to create those little micro connections. 
Say hello when you enter an elevator. This might seem a little bit odd, but it matters. Just the other day, I was at a hotel and I was, you know, I usually say hello to people unless I'm just in a mood or I'm just like, I just don't feel like engaging with any human beings right now, which I think I'm probably not the only one who has ever felt that way. Um, and I'm just like, I just want to keep to myself. But most of the time I try to just acknowledge other people's existence because there is over 7 billion of us on this planet. We may as well connect with each other. We may as well not have to feel alone and these little micro connections matter. And so I was at this hotel and I had gotten into the elevator and I just looked around the people and said hello as I entered the elevator. And then we stopped on the floor and this gentleman, and I'm going to say he was a gentleman because he was a gentleman to a T, walked into the elevator, looked at everyone in the eye and said, good afternoon. And then turned around and we just rode the elevator. And when the elevator stopped, he turned around, faced everyone in the elevator again and said, um, how about, or he said, so I can't remember what it was, but he said, he said, um, have a lovely afternoon. And then he exited. And that little bit of effort, it just felt so respectful. It felt so intentional. It felt so just like, not just a quick little hi glance, but a very intentional acknowledgement of the other human beings that he was in an enclosed situation with those things matter. And the two biggest bangs for your sense of belonging buck, build a strong relationship with yourself. We forget that we are the only human beings that have to live with us from the moment of birth to the moment we end this life and leave this life that we are with ourselves every single second in between. We forget that we are stuck with ourselves and forget that this is the longest standing relationship that we will ever have. We forget that that means that it's pretty darn important to have a good one, to build a strong relationship with ourselves, to not just learn how to tolerate ourselves, but how to like, and dare I say, love ourselves. Any close relationship that you have in your life that matters to you, that means something to you, that you value is someone that you love. So why do we think it's so weird? Such a foreign concept to learn how to love ourselves. There's no escaping ourselves. So building that relationship with ourselves, you have a good one with yourself, you're going to feel a whole lot less lonely. One of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou is that you are only free when you realize that you belong no place. You belong every place, no place at all. What this means is that when we belong with and to ourselves, we take our belonging everywhere we go. We don't need to be in one particular place in order to belong. We walk into a room, we belong. We're walking down the street, we belong. We show up at work, we belong. We belong everywhere we go. And the other one, join a common interest group that keeps connected. Routine interaction is one of the best ways to develop more meaningful relationships. Being involved, being with other humans who have a similar goal. It's so much easier to join a group, to be a part of something where you already know that you have something meaningful to you in common. You've already got that leg up. You've already got that place to start you already have the conversation that you know you can have. You know that people are going to get you. You know that people are going to understand you. You don't have to feel like this thing that's important to you, that you are working on, that you are working through, that you are working towards. You don't have to feel alone. Alyssa says, like the Shift Society. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the three types of connection that everyone needs. 
which is not going to come to as such a big surprise because we talked about the three types of loneliness that we can experience. So the three, three types of connection, intimate connection, having a close partner and or a close friend requirement to keep loneliness at bay, but not just that social connection, having some people that you can chat with or do activities with. We need that one as well. We also need collective connection, feeling involved and in alignment with others who share a common interest, a common goal, or a common purpose. We need all three of these. Truth number one, now in the 21st century, even with all of our modern technologies, we are the loneliness that humans have ever been in all of history. Truth number two, having a true sense of belonging requires three types of tethers to keep us feeling connected and grounded. If you picture a hot air balloon, keeping that hot air balloon on the ground requires ropes. It requires tethers. And for us, as well as humans, keeping us grounded, keeping us rooted, requires all three intimate connection, social connection, and collective connection. I don't want to put any pressure on you. I don't want to, you to make you feel like you have so long to go. I want to encourage you and inspire you to start somewhere. It doesn't matter where you start, but just start knowing the importance of these things. Truth number three is that being part of a group of like-minded humans with a deep desire for more peace, calm, confidence, and to feel connected and a part of something meaningful easily fulfills both the need for social connection and the need for collection, collective connection and being invested and involved in something with like-minded, like-hearted humans can also fulfill that intimate connection that you can meet your best friend in communities like this. You might even meet a partner in a community like this, which is why I wanna invite you to be a part of two things specifically or the option of either. The Shift Society, my membership community of like-minded, like-hearted people doing this work, learning, growing, healing, being invested and involved together with a common goal of healing, of growing, of expanding, of experiencing, thinking better, feeling better, living better, having better. People who get you that are committed to better with tools, with teachings, with community, with accountability, with help and support the whole way through. And for those of you who join the Shift Society, who are already in the Shift Society, we've gone a step further and we've created a live event here in Vancouver in just over a month called Big Shift Live, where are we gonna be coming together in real life to learn, to grow, to heal, to connect, to foster or deepen meaningful relationships over two intensive days led by me, supported by my team, invested in you. Why join the Shift Society or come and be a part of Big Shift Live or both? Research shows that listening to information has a 5% success rate of creating significant change in our brains. So listening to an audiobook, listening to a podcast, listening to someone speak will create, has about a 5% success rate, will create some degree of change. But if you really want to make sure information and knowledge really sticks, connects and makes lasting changes, writing down what you're learning and reflecting bumps that number up to 40%. And so writing down notes. So I said at the beginning, take some notes. You don't have to write down everything, but write down the key things that connect. But even more so than that, there's a special aspect of learning that bumps that number of success to a whopping 95%. And that aspect is the accountability, connection, and motivation 
that comes from learning and growing and healing and shifting in community. Here are some words from uh, our shifters. Tasha has said that building a deep relationship with myself in the shift society has been empowering and healing. Doing this work has been vital, vital in how I think and feel and show up in my life. It has changed everything. Sylvana says, Julia's thinking has helped me to think with intention, how to turn my habitual thinking into healthy and helpful thoughts. You won't regret joining. Catherine, who started off in the shift society uh, near the beginning, very skeptical, <laughs> made me work for every bit of trust that she could give, was willing to give, is now one of our beloved shift society coaches. Catherine has done the work and says, I used to live in a world of fear and judgment, overwhelm and people pleasing. But since joining the shift, I've learned to think differently about the experiences of my past and how my thoughts direct my feelings. Now I feel grateful, enthusiastic, connected with myself and resilient. Julia, but it wasn't me, it was her, got me unstuck. She got herself unstuck. I gave her the tools. She picked them up and used them. Chris says, I've been here for years. The Shift Society is addicting. Julia's workshops and lessons are the best practical mind manage management tools I have ever come to. I want you to take a moment and I want you to imagine if you could finally get past fear, shame, self-doubt, and crippling anxiety. You could feel a sense of inner peace that no one could take away from you. You could not only feel a true sense of belonging everywhere you go, but feel safe, comfortable, and confident being exactly who you are and loving yourself for it. Imagine if you had a community of like-minded, like-hearted humans to go to any time you needed to ask for help, get support, or celebrate a big shift. What would be different in your life if you even could experience one of these things? I wanna know, that wasn't a rhetorical question. What would be different? Looking at this list, the one that stood out to you the most, imagine. It would be Nirvana, <laughs> says Maria. I would more, have more joy and clarity. Feels like people can see through you. In a good way, Hannes? I'm wondering. In a good way, you're feeling exposed or you're feeling known and seen. Peaceful, with no anxiety. I would see no obstacles in my way. I would dance and be free, <laughs> which I have seen you do, Mila. <laughs> I would live with so much more inner peace, feel more alive. A lot of things get easier. Yeah. I feel like my real self. Mm. Oh, Wes. Oh, Wes. I cannot tell you how many years I felt completely numb to myself. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know if I had a personality. I didn't know how people perceived me. I had no awareness of myself, no connection to myself, kind of felt sort of like I was numb and floating for the majority of my life until I started doing this work. And that was sort of one of the secret byproducts of learning how to be a therapist is that it made me face a lot of things in myself and uncover a lot of my shadow that I didn't know was not just hiding on the sidelines, but was covering most of me. And how different I am now from the inside out than I was even just a few years ago. What's included in specifically the Shift Society? The supportive, inclusive community of like-hearted, amazing people you've been aching for. Coaching, daily coaching from me and the Shift coaches in both the Facebook group and weekly in our live group sessions. A whole library waiting for you of deep dive masterclasses on specific topics limited to, or sorry, including but not limited to this, the three steps of self-compassion, for those of you who are like, I want to learn how to be more self-compassionate. 
how to create self-compassion within myself. I walk you through the three steps and exactly how to do that, how to create deep lasting confidence from the inside out, the pillars, the requirements, the exercises that make you feel good, if not great about who you are every day, how to stop worrying about the future, stop those triggers and self-sabotage for those of you stuck in self-sabotage, how to move past shame for those of you have been feeling overcome by it, held back with it, pressed down from it, and how to create your future self, that you that you're like, I know that this is how I want to be in my life. How do I get there? I teach you in this masterclass. There are several more. I don't want to overwhelm you. There's pretty much a masterclass in there, a buffet, if you will, of whatever you could want, whatever you're working on, whatever you need, whatever you want to know more about, know how to do, what to heal, what to create, what to build, how to grow. That's in there. In addition to my five-step mind and emotional management tool that you can use in any situation. And it's going to both help you increase your emotional intelligence, but create emotional regulation and an ability to go through life with whatever or whoever is happening around you, feeling more grounded and clear and confident. It's called the shift society because what we know for sure is that big transformations happens one key shift at a time. You do the right shifts, you get the big results. It's not one moment in time where you have a breakthrough or an aha and everything is changed from there on out. No, it's one key connecting brain shift at a time that literally changes your brain makeup. It's not magic, it's neurobiology. And we work with neurobiology in the shift society to create those intentional shifts, the ones that create the lasting transformations. The cost, what people are waiting for. Whether you're a current shifter, former shifter, or someone who has admired the shift society, some shift society from afar, we have a registration option available for everyone. For those of you who are like, I just want to get into the shift society. I've been waiting forever to do this. We have that for you. You can come and join the shift society and commit. We want you to commit to two months because we want you to see what happens in two months. So we want you to commit for two months and be in there. So we have that for $197, two months of daily support and accountability and tools and teachings and the five-step process and the other human beings. And we really want you to come and invest yourself in two months because you are going to be surprised at how much can change within that two months. We want you to give that to yourself to show up and do the work. It doesn't happen on its own, but everyone who has come in and done this work sees things change in a significant way in the two months. The work works if you work it. So you can come and join the Shift Society for two months, and then you can stay on for $97 a month after that. And there's no long-term commitment, but we do want you to make that initial two-month commitment and then come and stay on after that um, and see what else is possible for you. There's another option if you have been a Shift Society member at any point or are currently a Shift Society member, you can come to Vancouver for on October 26th and 27th for Big Shift Live. This is going to be a powerful in-person experience or what we are going to do. We are going to motivate you. We are going to inspire you, inspire you. You are going to grow. You are going to do some profound healing in a short amount of time. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be joyful. It's going to be incredible. We have been planning for months for this, and we are so excited to bring this event in real life to you. So that one is $647 US for both days of Big Shift Live at a beautiful venue right in downtown Vancouver. If you've been aching to have a trip to Vancouver, this is your sign. This is your time. It's in the end of October as well, which is shoulder season. So costs of accommodations are a lot lower than usual. And so you get an opportunity to come and be in this city, be with these humans, be in this place, do this work over those two days. Or if you want to have both, 
get a ticket to Big Shift Live and two months in the Shift Society. That one is $747. So that is available as well. We want everyone at Big Shift Live to have done this work, who have the foundational knowledge of the core lessons under their belt because we want to go deeper. So we want people that have had that foundational teaching who are doing that foundational work. And then we are going to go beyond that at Big Shift Live. So that's why the ticket for just Big Shift Live is only available to people who have been in the Shift Society or are currently in the Shift Society. But if you're like, man, I'm not in the Shift Society, but I want to come to Big Shift Live, you still have a month. You can join, you can be there and you have a month to start getting the foundational brain shifting tools under your belt belt, so you can come and take this experience to the next level at Big Shift Live. Murat says, a relatively, re relatively junior member of the Shift Society for eight months, but I have been doing the work and there's a significant difference when compared to my day one. I see that, Murat. I see you doing the work. And I can see the shifts that you've been having. So how do you join? How do you get in on this? Keep an eye on your inbox. An email is going to be arriving within a few minutes with the link to join. You can also get the QR code right there. Scan that little QR code on your phone and it will take you right to the website where you can join. You will see on the website, on the on the um on the page that it'll take you to, that it is promoting Big Shift Live. But when you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you will see the three different options that I presented to you here. Oops, which was it? So you'll see these three different options that you can choose from on the page that that code takes you to, that the email is gonna take you to. It's gonna tell you a little bit more about Big Shift Live if that's something that you are ready and wanna do, then you can do that. But if you're like, you know what, Julia, I just wanna come and join the Shift Society for now. Um, so let me join that. Then you can choose that subscription option on there as well. And there is the link right in the chat if you wanna go there. Uh, Hannes, if you wanna come, uh, if you want a payment plan, then absolutely we do that. So you can come and yeah, you can email Ella. Uh, you can email us hello at juliachristina.com or just reply to the email that comes to your inbox in a few minutes with the registration information and we can set up a payment plan for you. We are absolutely happy to do that. Um, and that goes for any of you who are like, Ugh, I want to do this. I'm ready to do this. I want to make this investment, but I need a plan. So Absolutely. Um, there is the link right there. Ella has put it in there. Um, you can click on that and that's going to take you right there. Now, for those of you who have been waiting to join, you're like, what is this gift that you've been, that you promised us? What is this thing? We have a bonus for those of you who do sign up for any of these options before the end of our time together, before the end of our Q and a session that we're about to jump into we have a bonus for you. When you register before the work, this workshop ends today, you get 25 simple uh, conversation starters to build connection. That is going to be arriving in your inbox after you register for any of the three options. 25 simple conversation starters to build connection. For those of you who are like, yeah, I want to start feeling more connected. I want to start building more relationships, but I feel kind of awkward. I don't know what to talk about. I don't know how to build those beyond the just like, hi, how's your day? Nice to see you. I don't know where to go from there without feeling weird or awkward or just even having anything to say. So I don't say anything. We have put together 25 simple conversation starters to help you build that connection, to help feeling, help you feel more invested and involved in your community, in yourself, in other human beings, have better, more significant, more meaningful relationships in your life. Grab that 25 conversation starters. The power of community from members of the Shift Society. What I noticed with learning to manage my mind, my connection with family and friends has improved. Before I was so caught up in my own thoughts and mind, I struggled to stay present, feel anything really. I isolated myself because it was just easier. 
It's nice to finally feel connections again. As I open up about my struggles, be more trusting and vulnerable. Others have done the same. Watching my life and world expand is simply beautiful from Cindy, who is a current shifter and seeing how, as we talked about, building our relationship with ourselves naturally has this ripple effect of helping us have better relationships with others. This person said, I love the live sessions and the ability to have connections and share the experience of other shift members and real life examples of the work with Julia. What this person says is they love connections with coaches and shifters in being here during, during sessions, support and empowerment. There are many things that this person loves about the Shift Society. Join us for the Shift Society and or Big Shift Live. That link is here in the chat. Ella put it back here. If you scroll a little bit back, then you will see it. Ella, if you wanna just copy that into the chat again, there it is, she is on it. You can scan the QR code right in the middle there. We would love to have you and don't forget, if you do sign up before the end of our workshop today, you'll get those 25 conversation starters to build connection. I have enjoyed our time together. I am really glad that you have been here, Maria. I am so glad that you enjoyed it. One thing before we go into our questions, I want to know one thing that you got from this session, not the only thing, but one thing that you got from this session today. So my perfectionists who are like, oh my gosh, I have to think of the best thing. No, you don't, just one thing. One thing that you took from today's session that you're like, I, that mattered to me, that shifted something in me. Yes, Maria, I am so glad that you will be joining. You are going to love it. And we have many shifters here right now and uh, we are gonna welcome you. We can't wait to have you in the community. It, you are about to experience something incredible that has become so much more than I ever hoped or dreamed of. This community really is an incredible group of like-minded, like-hearted humans who are nothing but honest, vulnerable, real, supportive, encouraging, and helpful. We're all there ready to welcome you and bring you into the community with us. The gentleman that entered the elevator it was respectful and really so kind to greet them all. JC, it really meant a lot to me too. I took note. I took note and I'm like, I admire that. I want to be more of that. Yes. It doesn't need to be a big conversation, JC. Yes. Yes. Just making those efforts to stay connected. The different types of loneliness. Yes. Yeah. Right. It kind of makes things make more sense to be like, oh, there is these three parts. It's not just a one and done. Yeah. Maria says, um, hugs to everyone going through this journey of loneliness. The three different kinds of connection really stood out for me, says Josh. Josh. Yeah. Yeah. In this, in the, when I was doing the research, that was what really stood out for me too. And I was like, that is why, that is why I do not struggle with loneliness anymore after decades of feeling deeply lonely and disconnected and different. And just like there was something weird about me that couldn't be connected in um, the way I always wanted to. I, I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized that this is what was missing in order for that to happen. Um, valuable understanding about loneliness and how to prevent it and address it. Um, I remembered things I used to do when I felt better and I don't realize that they helped. Yes. Yes. It's amazing, Dylan, how often that happens when, you know, we'll be kind of doing well and life will be going pretty well. And then all of a sudden things start to fall apart and they don't feel as good. And we're struggling more and we're like, I don't know why I'm struggling so much. And then we start to look at what we stopped doing. Cause we're like, we were doing all these things that we knew were good for us, that were helping us. And then we're like, I'm feeling good. I don't need to do these things anymore. And then we stop doing them. And then we start to feel bad again. And we're like, oh, maybe, just maybe I was feeling good because I was being intentional about investing and involving myself in the things that helped me feel good, that helped me thrive. Oh yeah, I am a complex being and I require, I require things in order to thrive. Yeah. I'll probably get out of the house more. Thanks for the big, uh, thanks for the hug, Maria. Yes. Um, uh, uh, good to have you here, Mila. Thanks for joining. Uh, the little connections, the smile, saying hello, that I haven't realized how important that is. 
Yes. I didn't have no idea that loneliness can make people physically ill. Yeah. I love the idea of micro connections as meaningful, significant things. You don't quite realize how much those matter until they're pointed out to you. Exactly. Gregory feeling a part of something bigger, just creating that within, um, Oh, Hannah's found. Talk to me about the plan, payment plan. Yes, send an email. We, Ella, is available and she will connect with you about that. Many little things make a difference. Knowing more specific information says I usually feel difficult organizing information in my brain. Awesome. I'm glad that that helped, Gonzalo. New information and shocking and really makes me feel how important to make changes in that area are. Yeah, it's not uh, nice to have. It's a need to have intentionally investing myself into meaningful connections even if they are small connections multiple times throughout the day each day says Larika. yes yeah i'm going to pop over to the questions now uh this person said um okay these are just kind of technical questions so i'm not gonna answer this oh well actually one person said could loneliness have a relationship with overeating absolutely Absolutely. When we feel lonely, it feels bad. And what we know for sure is that eating sugary, carby, fatty foods, at least in the moment, makes us feel good. It makes us feel less empty physically and also emotionally because those types of food release endorphins in our brains. And so usually when it comes to binge eating, overeating, it's because we are trying to create a feeling that is lacking, an experience that is lacking. And so knowing that absolutely, you know, like any kind of problematic or addictive or unhealthy behavior, we're trying to have a need met. We're trying to fill a void. We're trying to escape a struggle or a pain. We're trying to feel better, feel something different. And the reason why we use these things is because in the moment they work, right? We're not stupid as humans. It feels good in the moment. It creates longer term, more detrimental effects that are harmful, but our brain doesn't think about that in the moment. What it thinks about is immediately wanting us to feel better. And these things work in the moment. And so that's why we do them. We're not dumb as humans. We are trying to always move towards pleasure and away from pain. That is what our brains do. But when we are not more conscious to ourselves, when we haven't done the deeper healing work, then we don't, we're not able to connect quite as readily to the choices we are making in the moment and, and whether or not it's worth the cost and being able to consciously make those decisions while connecting with the cost, not just the immediate reward. What are some quick tips on moving past rejection when someone rejects you and your story, and now I'm afraid to open up to other people? Knowing that some people just will not get you. They are not available or interested in getting you. And that's okay. It can hurt. It can feel bad. We can feel like we were duped or disillusioned that maybe someone seemed like they were interested or available at one point. And then all of a sudden they decided for whatever reason that they weren't. And we don't know what that reason is. What we want to do is not make that reason be because there's something wrong with us, because then we fall into shame and pain. And then we go into keeping people at bay in order to prevent that from happening instead of being like, you know what? It's not because there was something wrong with me. There was just something about this relationship that did not work. They were no longer available to be who I wanted, needed, or expected them to be. And that can happen. So just being like, I don't know what's going on with them. And I can say this from experience because I've had this happen to me as well, just randomly being ghosted or rejected or, you know, someone just pulling away without me knowing what happened. And even someone that I felt really close with, it ha it's happened a couple of times and being confused and having to just really take a step back and be like, you know what, this wasn't the right fit. This relationship wasn't what I thought it was and it, it changed and that can happen. And so I'm going to take some time to be with myself, to grieve that loss, to feel sad but I'm not going to turn this experience against myself. I am committed to that. Yeah. 
What if a family member is causing you anxiety because they are anxious? So this is a really good one. Learning how to separate ourselves from someone else's experience. So when you notice in your body that someone else's anxiety, that you are mirroring that, and if you are a more highly sensitive person, then it is going to be a lot more likely that you're going to do that. You're going to feel and take in and take on the emotions of others. It's part of being a highly sensitive person, which by the way, in the shift society, pretty much all of us are highly sensitive people. So what I teach you in there is how to um, how to regulate and manage yourself as a highly sensitive person, because it is a bit of a different set of tools that goes into it than someone who's less highly sensitive. And so we really focus on that type of person in there and give you the tools for that. So what you want to do just as a first step is to just notice in your body what it feels like when you are um, mirroring the emotions of someone else, and then take a step back, take a few breaths and being able to create a little bit of emotional sovereignty for yourself and be able to say their stuff is not my stuff. Their anxiety is not my anxiety. What they have going on is not what I have going on. And so I'm just going to give myself a moment to breathe and to be and to ground and regulate myself in this moment. That is going to be the first just sort of easy step to start with, just working on grounding yourself, consciously reminding yourself their emotion is not my emotion. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome, Marini. I hope that was helpful. Um, someone else in the chat here said, what do you, what do you do to start with the deep healing from past events? Um, and so that you can make better connections. Yeah. So man, Dan, that is a big question. Start to connect with the story that you have created from that. And I'm not saying it's a story, like a made up story, like it's not true, but just start to look at what did this shift in my brain from these past events, these painful events, what, what beliefs, what thoughts, what things are causing me to continue to struggle, right? So start with really understanding why is this a problem now? This thing that happened in the past, what are the residual effects of that now? And how is that impacting how I'm showing up? How is that impacting the thoughts that I'm thinking, the beliefs that I am experiencing, the emotions that I am having? So healing comes with developing consciousness and awareness and a discernment about how the past is impacting our present. We go more deeply into this, to be honest, in the shift society where we really go into healing shame and pain and we do it at a physical level, we do it at a cognitive level, we join the two and um, really just create those deep changes from the inside out. We've had hundreds of members who have gone through the Shift Society, done the teaching, done the work, who are even still there, many of them, after being there forever, because they kind of get, like Chris said, addicted to the community. I mean, addicted, I don't know if it's addictive or if it's just like this natural experience of when you find somewhere where you belong, you stick around where you find somewhere where what the work that you're working is working and you like working it with other people in there, then you stick around. And so, but yeah, so doing that in the shift society, I teach you how to do that at a deeper level, but just starting with uh, what from my past, how is my past impacting my present? What happened from that, that is continuing to impact me now because the past is done, but I'm still experiencing it in my present. What does that look like? What does that mean? Yeah. Maria says, I'm so excited about taking on a new leaf and com and combating this loneliness. Awesome, Maria. You are in good hands. Any other questions? Thank you for being here. Um, 
What about people with avoided attachment or anxious, how that affect loneliness? So Allah, that is going to be really about creating safety within yourself because anxious and avoidant are both um, a lack of safety within self. And so creating a safe, connected relationship with yourself feels a lot less, makes it feel a lot less risky to let yourself be close to other people. Um, so yeah, and that's why I talked about in this is one of the keys to building better connections with others is to start with building a better connection with ourselves. And we teach you how to do that in the shift society. We teach you how to develop a strong and secure relationship with yourself. So when you join, we ask you to start on the core lessons first. And then there's also a masterclass in there called deep lasting confidence that is really about healing any, um, wounds of relationship within yourself and then learning how to have a calm and clear and confident relationship from deep within. And that really is the most important step for being able to create secure attachment is to be securely attached within yourself. Yes. Yeah. You are welcome, Terry and Yao and Rena and Liz and Josh and Lindsay and Irini. Uh, Thank you for being here. Well, will uh, so uh, what did this person say? Will weird anxiety around driving be addressed, or should I take your anxiety course first? Shifters who are here now, we definitely address weird anxiety. <laughs> I love that way of saying it, Cheryl. We definitely address anxiety, all types of anxiety. Actually, you could use um, the model. You use the, of course, sorry, I don't know where the, my brain went with this. The foundational model is going to be an, a very powerful thing for getting past your driving anxiety. It's going to really help you uncover why you are afraid of driving deep down inside and then what to how to kind of rewire those fear responses to the driving. And then we walk you through a process called systematic desensitization that helps you kind of build up your tolerance of driving slowly and incrementally so that it kind of shifts within your brain. So we have definitely had a lot of people come into the shift society, learn the, learn the tools, learn the, um, the model. Sorry, my brain just went somewhere for a second. And then use that and apply that to anxiety provoking situations. Uh, absolutely. The main things that we deal with in the shift society that people come for are anxiety, depression, self-esteem. And those are the things that we really deeply focus on. And then we use these other tools and teachings um, and kind of uh, attack all of these struggles from a holistic approach, from a whole rounded approach. So it's not just specifically always about how to deal with anxiety, but often understanding that anxiety comes from a lack of uh, deeper trust and safety within ourselves. It comes from an unmet need within ourselves. It comes, it's based in fear. So how do we deal with that underlying fear so that we no longer have to stay stuck in that fear? And so absolutely, we go into the deeper realms of these different things that we struggle with, and we heal them from the inside out instead of just giving um, some tips and tricks to manage the symptoms, which we do as well, because those are helpful. Managing the symptoms are very helpful, but then we go deeper to rewire uh, our brains so that we're not experiencing that the same level of, of, of anxiety or depression that we were before. So really working from the inside out and then also creating a robust, solid sense of self in there as well. So great question. Um, how do we stop having thought patterns from the past? What I know for sure, Yao, is that our brains are far more, so I didn't need to sigh. I wasn't sighing at your question. I just realized I'm just tired because I've been, you know, on and teaching uh, intensely for the last hour and a half. And that is a big question. It is a good question. And I am so glad that you asked it because it's an important one. Um, what are what we know about the human brain is it is far more responsive to starting something than stopping something. So if you want to stop something, 
then redirect your brain towards starting something. So if you want to stop having thoughts, patterns from the past, then when those thought patterns show up, start redirecting your brain to something else. And you're going to have to kind of do the work um, to know how to direct it towards something that's going to be helpful. We do teach you that in the shift society, how to direct your brain to thoughts that are actually going to make a difference instead of just telling yourself, just think positive or just get over it or just don't worry about it. Right. That often doesn't do the trick. And so we teach you how to create the thoughts in your brains that do make that connection. The thoughts you want to be thinking that are actually going to stick and be helpful and stay around and make the difference, which isn't just any kind of random quote unquote quote, positive thought. We teach you how to do that. But the first thing I want you to know is if you want to stop something, instead of focusing on stopping, turn your focus towards starting something different. How long do we have to sign up for the Shift Society? We're going to keep registration open for the next few days, Lindsay. So keep watch for that. We will let you know when registration closes for this. Um, but if you are thinking about it, jump in now because we are ready for you and you can start on lesson one. And lesson one in your core lessons teaches you how to get in touch with your emotions and process big emotions through your body when they come up, really starting to understand what emotions are and how to process them when they are showing up. So you can jump into that right now. The thing about the core lessons is that they are all short. Um, and so they're short bite-sized lessons that you learn, you learn some information, you learn, have gained some understanding, and then you learn a skill. And then you start practicing that skill for a few days and really implementing that, getting used to that before you come back and then do the next lesson. So it's not like in the lessons, they're like tons and tons and tons of information. They are short to the point, powerful little tools that when we build on, the, on them from lesson to lesson, teach you how to become more emotionally intelligent, how, how to understand your emotions, deal with your emotions, move through your emotions, create different emotions, and then change your brain and your thought patterns and your core beliefs that are holding you, you back in that process. So we come at it from the emotional level, we come at it from the cognitive level, we marry the two and teach you how to set yourself free.